once again, Dartmouth sports fans, welcome in to another edition of Big Green Classic. As this evening, we will highlight the 2015 Dartmouth women's soccer matchup taking on Cornell from November 7th. 2015 from Burnham Field in Hanover, New Hampshire. Hi, everybody. I'm Brett Franklin. Great to have you aboard. And we uh, welcome back as we introduce our guest for tonight's broadcast. We welcome back the uh, head coach of Dartmouth women's soccer, Ron Rainey. Ron, good to see you again. How are you? Good. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having us, Brett. Looking forward to watching the game with Shar and Gia. And, and, as, and as you mentioned, our uh, two other guests uh, from the class of 2018 midfielder from Amherst, Massachusetts. We welcome Gia Parker. How are you, Gia? Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us and also joining us, the class of 2020, a forward from Newberry, Massachusetts, Charlotte Esty joining us. How are you, Charlotte? Hi, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. And we thank everybody for uh, joining us here uh, on this broadcast and what should be a lot of fun as, uh, again, these two teams Kind of setting the scene here, uh, the Big Green and the Cornell uh, Big Red uh, capping off the 2015 season in Hanover. Uh, this was the final match of that regular season. Uh, Dartmouth coming off a two-overtime tie at Harvard the week prior. And uh, this was also a little bit of a revenge game for the Dartmouth Big Green after falling at Cornell in the 2014 season in a tough 1-0 loss up in uh, Ithaca. And uh, Ron, we'll uh, start with you. As we uh, mentioned, uh, both of these teams going at it here in a, in a very competitive game. Uh, you know, I, as we mentioned, previous year's matchup, uh, Cornell played a little bit of spoiler as your team was in the hunt for, uh, for an Ivy League championship in the last weekend. So got to imagine uh, this was a game that uh, your squad and your staff uh, were very much looking forward to to close out the season. I believe so, and, and, and the way the Ivy schedule is set up, Cornell is always the, the last game of the season. So this is, um, this is also senior day. Um, you can tell it's a, it's a pretty nice day. But um, it, it was kind of the year before, it was kind of a wild situation because um, we needed to get a result against Cornell, and we needed, I believe, Harvard to um, lose. And... And you, you try not to be a scoreboard watcher, and I don't think our team knew it when we were out there, right, but so we kind of had it on our phones, and, and we saw at halftime um, that Harvard had won their game, and so they had won the Ivy League. Um, that didn't change the fact that um, that, that, that we, we lost 1-0 and, and wanted to get a good result in this game here. Uh, Gia, uh, looking at uh, this season, uh, this was your sophomore uh, season in 2015. Uh, leading up to this contest against Cornell, um, you know, played a really tough match uh, against Harvard uh, the week before. Again, a double, double overtime 1-1 uh, tie. Um, but it kind of seemed like that game, even though it didn't come out as a victory, it seemed like it kind of led to some good momentum going into this game. And as we'll see, a good start for your big green squad. But kind of talk to us about the feeling going into this matchup with Cornell coming off uh, that good performance uh, against Harvard the week prior. Gosh, you're testing my memory here. <laughs> um, I think I remember, as Ron mentioned, um, my freshman year, so I was 2014. We had just beat Harvard on senior day, and it was, um, I think it was two to one, maybe, or three to one. Like, it was a great result, and so we had a lot of energy momentum going into Cornell. And I think this was the same. It's always, because the Ivy League is always the same. You play Harvard and then Cornell. I think that we always have a lot of energy going into this game because we always typically have a, a good showing with Harvard. And so I can imagine that this, this year was similar to the year before. And everyone was really excited to get going. And senior day is always exciting as well. I'm sure it adds on to that extra layer of, you know, again, everything that's going on with the final game of the season. And Charlotte, uh, you know, when you look at, you know, that final matchup of the year, you know, we, we don't really typically think about it. But, I mean, it's such a long season when you think of preseason, where you're starting, and then, of course, starting games in late August. But, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure – Part of that Ivy League grind, you know, when you when you go up against Cornell, it's it's throw everything out the window when you go up against the Big Red. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's always a very yeah. fun one. And, and and I gotta imagine too when you when you don't have to make that trek to Ithaca it makes that game a little bit more 
easier to play, I, I would imagine, just just from sitting here. Um, but you just talk a little bit about, you know, going up against Cornell during your career, Charlotte, and, and just kind of, you know, that, you know, what is that atmosphere like, especially being the final game of the year when you guys usually hook up? It's so I'll start with the most recent um, battle with Cornell because that was probably my favorite game of my entire time at Dartmouth. Um, it was obviously like my last game, and so it was completely so sad, but bitter, like I guess bittersweet because we had so much energy and we were so excited to be there, also. And we just it was some of the best we played, and so that was amazing. Um, but we, we, as you mentioned, we often go into that last game with like just so much energy and sometimes it's frantic energy, sometimes it's like crazy energy, but it's always just a really fun game um, for sure and a great matchup. Ron, you've been doing this for quite some time and when you go into, you know, again, j just a game alone, there's obviously pressure there, but you know, last game, senior day, like you talked about, there, there's a lot of emotions that come with that and I imagine uh, you know, that's something as a player and as a coach, you kind of have to keep in check a little bit, you know, you, hey, we still got a game to play, but obviously this is a, you know, a final game for a lot of players in their senior day. Yeah, for sure. And, and di I, I, I've done this for a little while now and, and, um, and different coaches are doing different things with their senior day. Now you see some schools doing it on their last non-conference game. You're seeing some people do the senior day ceremony after the game is over i've always thought you know during during my time at dartmouth i think it's the best school i've ever been at as far as channeling maybe the energy the nerves the you know just the culmination all those different things that go into it i think dartmouth has channeled it the the, the best i don't think there's been one senior day um you know during the six years um, the, the previous six years that the team hasn't shown really well and, and played well. Um, and that's, that's a tribute to the players. And it's probably also a tribute, um, I think, to the student, like our players and their focus, and they're able to be real excited, but then say, okay, it's time to get some things done here on the field. And, and so those, those things have always been really, really good. And, and again, it, with, with the schedule, it's every other year. So our, the, the seniors, it's either, um, it's either Cornell or it's Harvard um, with, that, with that senior day. But, but every time we've done it, I think our energy level has been incredible. Gia, do you remember uh, your senior day game and just kind of everything that came with it? Yeah, we beat Cornell. And I remember it, I think it had been maybe a couple of years since we had done that. Can't really remember, but... There's always just great energy going into it, and ah, gosh, it's probably one of my top two moments of my life. I would say that night, just because you know, 18 plus years of playing the sport, all coming down to that one last game, and just ended on a good note. So, and uh, Charlie, you were telling us a little bit about your last game, but just as far as like the emotions and and everything that goes with it, how were you able to? channel that and deal with that as you went into your final contest oh gosh <laughs> it was um it was so hard because <laughs> it was so sad i remember at the end like i think we stood on the field for another five ten minutes i don't even know just like <laughs> crying um but because it was totally surreal to have again as you said like the eight, past 18 years of your life were dedicated to soccer and now to have it come to an end was so sad. But I also remember it being like one of the happiest moments because to be able to say that we ended on that high of a note was so amazing. Because um, that's, that's kind of all you can ask for at that last game is to have fun with it, to play, to be proud of your performance and to have a great team win. And we were able to accomplish all of those things. So it was, it was amazing. Ron, I would imagine from a coaching perspective, you know, you, you want to end that season on a high note and build that momentum going into next year. So while, you know, obviously you, you'll lose some players after said senior day game, you obviously want to build some momentum going into next season. So, you know, that, that I imagine that game for you is very important in trying to, you know, in trying to build off of one season going into next year. I think so. You know, I, I think that – 
season. We are able with with soccer. You're able to have a spring season. You're able to have um, games, but it, but it it doesn't come close to comparing the the intensity level and 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 how people are in an Ivy League game. So it's kind of you want you want to leave the field with a good good taste in your mouth and. And and while again you, you don't win every game, you want to leave saying, "Hey, we 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 put it all out there and we left it all out there." And um, again, and you know, uh, usually when a team plays well on Senior Day or when a team There's plays well on their last wide. game, it it usually does coincide with the last week of practice being pretty um, pretty intense and pretty good. And and again, that's something that the Dartmouth teams have done very well. You know, and and when they go into this game, they're what what you all um two weeks away from finals this game usually um and so they're deep in the quarter and 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 um and have a lot of things going on test wise and paper wise but we had um it, it it's been a good week of practice usually leading to a good game uh charlotte can you speak to uh, what coach has talked about you know you're dealing not only with you know practice and, and obviously your season uh, but balancing that academic life as well. Um, can you talk to us about, you know, balancing uh, academics, being a student athlete, and how maybe that changed for you as you went through your Dartmouth career? Yeah, I think, I mean, I've always really appreciated the the schedule that is per, like given to us from sports because I like having a routine and having – being forced to really manage my time well because left to my own devices, I'm not as good at that, definitely. Um, so I, I always find that I'm grateful for <laughs> having the practices and having everything kind of laid out for me. Um, it's definitely not easy, but you get into a rhythm and you get comfortable with it and it's great. I mean, soccer becomes like a stress relief uh, for you and you look forward to it is taking a break from your work and going to practice and everything. So I was always really appreciative of it for sure. Gia, your experience being a student athlete at Dartmouth and, and having that balance, you know, soccer and, and obviously uh, academics. Yeah. I always found honestly that being in season made it almost a little bit easier to focus saying, missing some class maybe not the easiest but having pretty much your only two focuses being soccer and school I remember on like away trips we would all study in the hotel lab, uh, lobbies together and um, before practice once that I mean my senior year we had that um, the Riley pavilion built and so everyone come into that classroom before practice and do work together so kind of being in it together helped a lot and, and Ron, from your time uh, being at Dartmouth, um, you know, how, how have you put into perspective, you know, you, you came from Iowa, uh, you know, coming to an institution like Dartmouth, where obviously academics is, is, is a high priority. Um, what was your first impression of that, you know, life being a student athlete in the Ivy League, just from your perspective and, you know, and how you've seen it over the years? Um. Well, it, you know, I, shoot, I have a ton of stories and, and like all, all the schools I've been at have, have, have all been good schools and, and the purpose of people going to school and playing sports is to get a degree. Um, Dartmouth, the, the, the classes are harder and, and, the, and there's a lot of bright students in the classes. And so I think that one of the things that I, I talk to people about now and, and maybe even talk to the team about a little bit more is to not get too caught up in comparison in the classroom, but rather, rather, um, you know, use, use the, the professor, use the students in your classes to make you a better student because there's, there's such intelligent people around you and they're high achievers too. Um, I, I mean, being totally honest, if if you're if you're out of if you're out of school that has, um, like if you were at Iowa or if you have Ball State or Tau, some of the others, if you were in a class that had 200 people, you know, if, if you showed up to class, you probably jumped ahead of about 100 of them because some are in a C's get degrees mode, and and um, and and again, so. In those schools, we talked about competing against the people in those classes, and that would be a way maybe to 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 get really really good grades. Um, I, again, I hope that nobody's watching from those schools or graduated from those schools right now. But it's the truth. Um, and and 
And when I came to Dartmouth, I said some of those things. And and I forget who said it. It might have been Holly um, Patterson from, um, it might have been Holly from, from New Zealand. She said, she said, I said that about competing against people in, in your classes. She said, coach, there's a lot of smart people in my classes. And so it made me, it made me think about it a little bit more. And now we just talk about Go go do your best and use those nice. use those other students for for you to be a better student. The other way I kind of found some of those things out is over the last, um, and I got this from Bob Whalen, our baseball coach. Over the last year and a half, um, the coaches have all gone to a class with our players, and so even last spring I did a Zoom class um, with with a player, and and just sitting in the classroom and hearing the professors and. And here in the students, I mean, it's a really cool thing about Dartmouth. And so you're really talking about a student athlete experience um, when, you know, no matter what major you're in at Dartmouth and no, no matter what your academic path, you are truly a student athlete during your four years. So that's going to lead me to my next question. And Gia, I'll start with you. Uh, what led you to play soccer at Dartmouth? Tell us about your journey to Hanover and how it all came together. My mom likes to tell it that it started with my U11 soccer coach, uh, Tom O'Donnell. If you're watching, Tom, thank you for everything. Uh, he said to my mom at U11, like, you know, Gia should look at Dartmouth. And of course, like then I was like, what's Dartmouth? But then when it got more real and I was, I don't know, 13, 14, um, I did some camps. I actually, I'm from Amherst since I was at an Amherst college camp and Kelly Cuss, the coach, our old assistant coach was at the camp and, um, we got along pretty well. And so I, I think went up to Dartmouth's camp and then committed, didn't have to convince me very hard. <laughs> pretty sure I just visited Dartmouth and I was like, yep, this is it. <laughs> the campus is beautiful. Everyone is so welcoming. Um, and I'm glad I, I have no regrets. Charlotte, uh, care to share us uh, your journey to Hanover? Yeah, um, I got pretty lucky. I My club teammates, just a bunch of the girls and the moms, I guess, decided that um, a group should kind of go up to the camp. And it was the summer entering ninth grade just to see, like, what it would be like to go to a like a camp where college coaches are there so that going into high school, we like knew what we like, what we're getting into and have a sense of that. And I showed up and I was like, I really love this place. And my parents are like, you're, you're just left eighth grade. Like go look at some other schools. Like you're like 13 or 14. Like you don't know that, like keep going to school and like looking at other places. And then came back like the next two summers and was like no no no, I really really love this place um I promise now I have more perspective like this is where I want to be um and got really fortunate to get an offer out of um one of the camp sessions um and I'm so grateful that I did because there was no turning back after that first summer I don't think I would have been happy anywhere else so coach can you Talk to us, you know, what you seek out in a recruit, what you what you look for in a player that you want to bring into your program. If there is, you know, say a player out there, just like a, a young Charlotte or a young Gia, you know, if they want to come to do, what are some of the intangibles that you look for that you say, we need this player to have this for them to be a successful part of this program? You know, um, I think one of the big things is, I, I mean, it, it, it really boils down to we're trying to find the, 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 best, the best students who can handle the rigor of, of, of the Ivy League and the classes, and then the best soccer players. Um, and, and on top of that, the best teammates, because that's, that's, a, that's a huge part of all this, you know, finding players that can make the experience better, um, better for, for those people um, around them. And, and I think like Gia and, and, and Charlotte, you know, know that better than anybody. You, you want to be in a, in a room, in a locker room where you're all rooting for each other and all happy for each other's successes and, and then all supportive when, when, um, of each other, if, if things don't go, um, your way individually or the team's way or things like that, because that's, I think what helps get you through, um, the lows and, and then it helps you celebrate the highs for sure. Um, 
And so again, one of the big things I think is is um is is finding players who are gonna going to be able to compete and then not only that that have a high ceiling that are that are going to get better um each season they're there better as a student better as a person better as a player and um and and again one of the challenges doing that at an at an ivy league institution where um where the um there are some things that are a grind and and you know the classes and and the rigor of them can can become a grind sometimes and and like these two said having the having the soccer to um to to kind of give you that balance hopefully um helps and and helps people improve through um through all four seasons because you know like charlotte was saying hey in ninth grade, I was like, Ooh, that's a bet. That, that's a good school. That's a place I want to be. Well, obviously Charlotte's a different soccer player as a freshman and then as a junior in college and as a senior and now after college than she was in ninth grade. So that having people that want to have that constant improvement, um, is really, really important to find. When we look at Gia and Charlotte, the way that you guys kind of uh, came into this program, you know, uh, I'll start with you, Gia, you know, you look at, your freshman year, you played in just five games, all as a reserve. The following uh, season, the season we're watching, 2015, uh, you played in 11 games, scored your first collegiate goal against a Sacred Heart uh, on uh, September 20th of that season. Uh, can you talk to us, you know, what it was like going from that freshman year to your sophomore year, trying to break more into the lineup and trying to get more playing time and just how you did that personally and how that kind of worked out and eventually – uh, to when you graduated. Yeah, I think the hard thing for a lot of freshmen is that everyone comes in and obviously you got to Dartmouth because you're one of the best players on your club team. So everyone comes in with the attitude like, I was the best player on my club team. Like, of course I should be playing. And so I think once you can get past that and realize like, no, there's more to it than that. It's college. You know, you have to be stronger. You have to be fitter. There's 26 people fighting for the same spots. So once I think I sort of got past that initial, like, why am I not playing? And realized that it's like, oh, I can actually do something about this. I can work harder. I can get an extra reps. I can watch more film. So I think um, through that freshman season, through that shifted for me and the off season that winter, um, my whole class was on. And I think a lot of, I think the junior class that we're watching now, seniors here were on and so there's a lot of um a lot of players on that sort of helped me grow in the off season so then coming into sophomore year i think my attitude had changed and also my work ethic had changed and set me up to get more playing time charlotte when we look at the beginning of your career you went right started right into the fire started in uh, all 15 games uh, played uh, as a freshman you were second on the team uh in goals uh that year what clicked for you year one as a freshman? Um, I don't know. That was a while ago. But um, I think I came in and was like, I want to be on the field and will do whatever it takes to kind of be on the field. And that was my attitude. And that was my attitude for all four years. And obviously, every season's different. All the demands are different. But no matter what, like you were saying, like, just – Showing up and grinding like every day was one of the biggest things um, and was kind of just how I like what defined my career I think is that whether I was playing in all 15 games or whether I wasn't like didn't start any of the 15 games then like I was there to get better and I wanted to just get as many reps as possible and get as much time on the ball as possible and I was so fortunate to have coaching staff that like come out early and get shots off and get reps and help me um and that was one of my favorite parts is that I always had people to turn to whether it was like my teammates or the staff who would be willing to come out and keep playing and spend hours before or after practice um shooting and doing all that which is um was one of my favorite parts about playing at Dartmouth and playing in college. Just always having someone there to play with. These, Ron, can, yeah, these, yeah, go ahead, Ron. These two, Brett, they, these two were like, they're great examples of people who would come out early or stay late or, you know, um, different things like that. Some of the work I, 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 I believe, I believe Charlotte was our, uh, a lifter of the week Freeman at some point during her time. Gia, I don't know. What what did you go from probably pull-ups your freshman year to, to pull-ups by your senior year? You probably – Three to 19. 
Three to 19. That's, that's not, that's not a little improvement. That's a big improvement. So, I mean, but, but it is, it just, it does show like the, 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 um, the commitment to get him better, you know, each, each year and each season. And, 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 and again, that's, that's, that's a, that's a skill and that's, that's a talent to, to be able to do that, to show up and just, um, and get better and do those things to get better because it, it isn't always easy um, for sure. But these two are real good examples of that. Yeah. I was just going to follow up there, Ron, you know, in, in, in regards to each G and, and Charlotte, um, you know, what did you see? Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what you saw from G and the differences from that freshman to sophomore campaign. And then speak to Charlotte, who saw a lot of action right away. What did you kind of see in both those players as far as their development uh, in cracking the lineup? Yeah, um, I think Gia was a great example of, um, of her work ethic. And then also, was it sophomore year, Gia, that, sophomore year when we went 3-5-2? To the I think it might have been junior year. Junior year, maybe? Yeah. Well, well, again, like, so, but one of the things that coaches always notice um, a little bit is, is, is um, you know, making that impression. And we have a really short preseason. The preseason for the Ivy League is only 10 days, and you're, and you're starting to play games. And so having that, you know, coming in fit, um, allows people to to show and do really well at the at the start of the year. Lucas it also it, it also okay. gives notice to your teammates. There. You know, hey, this is the work I put in, um, and nice and allows people to um, be impressed by that, and and it also give, gains confidence and those type of things. Lucy With it, as there. we're watching this game on Burnham. Um, and again, Burnham Field is one of the best fields in the country, bar none. I mean, this is this game's being played in November, and look at the grass right now; it's awesome. But like you can see, this field, the ball's in play a lot, and there is width to it. So, like like Gia did a ton of running in the game, um, in games um, because of that fitness. It allowed her to do a ton of running, and so those are things that helped her a lot. And then her skill of on the ball. Um, Charlotte, one of, one of the things that, and, and we'll get to talking about what Charlotte's doing a little bit later on, and it'll be interesting to hear the soccer experience right now. But Charlotte um, makes very, very smart runs in the attacking third. So when, when, um, when, when like we when we had possession and good possession and was able to drive a team back like it it's it's a huge talent to be able to make runs to open up space for yourself or teammates when all of a sudden there's 10 people within um 10 opponents within 40 yards of the goal and usually there's only six or seven attackers and so you have to um you have to move off the ball you have to make space um to be able to come up with attacking chances and that's and that's a huge talent that um that charlotte has yeah one of the things when i asked uh, several folks uh, about gia and someone said her speed you know she had great speed uh, on the field and um and and you talked about it ron i mean that's something that seems like uh was worked on during during that season uh, as uh, as well and I, I think we may have mentioned it uh, the last time ron but i, I think it'd be fascinating for those who, who maybe didn't hear it the first time you know um that that big difference going from club high school soccer to that division one level i mean i, I think it's it's you know you, you say you can kind of prepare for it but until you see it in real time i think it's it's certainly an eye-opener would you say for sure and and and, and the, these two will have great um thoughts about that um as well but it's and it's not just it's not just physical speed it's the speed of thought and and then the technical speed with the ball even right there that was uh, lucille kozlov that little shimmy she did where a defender thought they were in great position and she just shook her shoulders and was able to turn out a pressure but doing it in one touch um is is just something that um it, that that is is definitely um, uh, a, a change probably as you go 
a little bit from club to, to high school. And in, in club, the, these two played on very good club teams and, and they played against really, really good players. But it, it's it's just um, now on the on the soccer field, it's a on in the college game. It's 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 good players at every single position. And, and people and people coming into the game as well, you know, um, going 16, 17, 18 people deep. Charlotte, do you want to talk about that jump from club, high school, ball to that college, uh, Division One college play? And what, what was the biggest surprise to you when you made that uh, jump? I think the biggest surprise was definitely the speed and athleticism of, like, the players because I had always grown, like, growing up in one of the, like, fastest ones and then I looked around in the first game probably and was like oh my god like I'm not fast <laughs> like or everybody's fast but like it's not gonna do anything for me here um so it definitely kind of encouraged me to keep working on that but also to like improve other areas of the game like Ron said decision making um creativity doing things where like even if you're not the fastest one on the field you have an answer to when the ball gets to your feet and it, you can have something else that makes you special because like I realized very quickly that my speed was not going to be what was going to set me apart from other players and I needed to start finding other things that made me effective on the field <laughs> Gia, what was that jump like uh, going to Division One soccer as a freshman? Yeah, I mean, like Ron said, you're going to have every position on the field that's going to be the best player, not just in club where you have like three or four kids who are maybe going to play Division One. So I think uh, the jump, especially for me, was the athleticism piece of it. I used to be, you know, the fastest, like Char said, but then when you get there, everybody's just that fast. So you definitely need to find different ways to stand out, whether it's like technically or with your decision making. So Nobody's that's I think that's how I spent after freshman year, finding different ways to stand out on the field. Uh, I'll ask you a follow up here, Gia. Uh, you know, what, what do you think as part of your game most improved from when you walked on to Hanover, walked into Hanover and when you left? Do you think there's a certain aspect of your game that you felt you improved on the most in those four years? Um, I think my fitness, um, I found out that I could run a lot if I worked on it. And so that sort of helped me be able to stay in games longer than I maybe could have my freshman year. Um, but then just, I think, smart decision-making. You can't take 100 touches on the field in a game like this. A lot of it's one and two touch, and so I think that changed a lot of my game. Same question to you, Charlotte. What do you think uh, the most part of your game was improved uh, from your freshman year to when you graduated? Um, I think for me, it would be kind of shifting nice the ability to like shift my game and become stronger because I, when I realized I wasn't that fast um, and that I was getting bullied a little bit back to goal as a freshman, um, kind of realized I had to be stronger and figure that out. And I was lucky we had like the most amazing strength coaches. And so they, you know, forced us pretty much to get stronger every day and that changed my game in ways that like I didn't even I didn't necessarily even think about it as I was as it was happening and then I like started to realize that the work that they did with us like had amazing benefits and I was finally like getting a lot more comfortable um posting up and doing things like that which I hadn't been in high school I'm sure, Ron, when you come into preseason, especially when you get an in fresh, incoming freshman class, you know, I'm sure you get players and, you know, that they, they know the world. But obviously, you know, it's a whole different ball of wax when you when you start getting into to actual play. How do you go about, you know, when ingra you know, ingraining those freshmen, whether it is someone like Charlotte who is getting a lot of time uh, playing in her first year? I'm just kind of curious how your approach to – ingraining your freshman into the program and, and how you go about that through the season you know that that's i think one of the advantages of of the day plan um and so um and i think that this season was the start of instead of having two weeks of the rest of division one playing games, it just went down to one week um, because from an equity standpoint, um, the Ivy league, we, we were having one less week than, um, than the men's soccer. And, and so, so um, 
So we get to school like right around the middle of August and then we don't have um, we don't have class until the middle of September. Um, now starting early also has our sophomore summers in class a little bit longer and so we have to deal with them in finals um, as we're heading into our first weekend of, of live games. But so again, long story, but like during that time, those freshmen are able one to, to get some training and, and listen to the older players because um, those older players have been through preseasons and, and, um, and, and probably have some of that confidence or knowledge of, of how a season or the rhythm of a season goes. So hopefully they're listening to those players. And then, and then you, you, you want to right from the, the start, start talking about, okay, can we take one less touch there? Can we, you know, can we play a little bit faster? Can we open our hips? Can we check our shoulders? So just some of the little things that allow you to play a little bit faster. Um, but, but then taking advantage of the D plan and not starting until the middle of September, there, there's a lot of learning that goes on for those first years. Um, not just from a soccer standpoint, but getting to know Dartmouth, um, meeting the academic advisors, figuring out what classes to take. And hopefully they're doing that with their teammates. And so that bonds the team together a little bit. So if there is a day maybe where a first year doesn't have maybe as good of a day as they want it to, hopefully by that time they, they, they become close to a couple older players and, and probably the answer from some of those older players is, you know what, it's just one day, wake up tomorrow, have a great day. And, and again, the coaches can say those things, but when it comes from a teammate, um, it, it, means, it means just so much more. Um, and so we, we are lucky that we have that, that space of time to do some team builders and get people acclimated to um, not just the season, but to Dartmouth as well. Uh, put you on, putting you on the spot here, GN Charlotte, was there a, and I'll start with you, Charlotte, was there a welcome to Dartmouth moment as a freshman? Uh, did you have one of those moments where you're like, oh, okay, you know, yeah, I'm, you know, this, uh, I'm, I'm here at Dart, I'm, I'm away from home, I'm in, I'm in college, was there that welcome to Dartmouth moment, whether it was on the team or just in general? And back to her. I can't think of one on the team, but I think just my first night there being dropped off, like Ron said, we, our preseason was aligned a little bit differently with everyone else's. And so when I showed up, I was like the only person alone in my dorm. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm here. Nobody else is here. Like this is college, I guess, um, which is kind of wild. And of course, you have those like preseason jitters, like the night bef the nights leading up to your first day um, showing up, and so all of that kind of coming together was a lot the first night. But I was lucky that I had teammates like Gia to make it easier, um, for sure. Gia, did you have a welcome to Dartmouth moment as a freshman? None that I could think of in a bad way. I guess in a good way, it would just be our first. <laughs> fitness tests. I feel like I don't think I've ever been more nervous in my life. Probably the top four most nerve wracking moments of my life were each four of our fitness tests. It never got any easier, <laughs> but I think just having the whole team rally around you and you're all in it together. I think right then, like that, that moment was my welcome to Dartmouth. Like this is it. You're in college now. <laughs> Ron, you know, there, there's a method to every coach's madness. And, you know, Gia brought up fitness, and you do have those fitness tests, uh, you know, every preseason camp. But I, I got to imagine, you know, and we've talked about it. You mentioned, you know, Gia and how she was able to develop her speed as her career went along. But, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, there's a reason why you're doing those fitness tests. It's for these games here, like against Cornell at the end of the year. So you have you can go into those overtime games. You can outrun your opponent. I mean, there, there is there is a method to your madness out there, especially with the fitness test. Yeah, for sure. And 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 with a short preseason, you, you really need you really need the, the the team to come back in shape and and fit. And again, that's that's something this the, the Dartmouth teams have done I would say I would say pretty well with and 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 in some seasons really, really well. Um, because in the in the end the one thing you have to talk about is, hey, we're going to have these 10 days, but then your first month of the season, the teams you're going up against have had one one weekend of games, 
before we start playing them. And then about, eh, about 16 more days of practice. So, so some of the things that, that we ask our, we ask of our players is to do some of that extra work so we can close that gap. Um, when we have some of our early season games, I was going to, I was going to tell these guys, one of the different things with COVID right now and that, that we did differently this year was we came in and we kind of ramped up slow. We went slowly, um, you know, like the first week. And some of that was training in masks and, and those type of things. Um, but you, we, we went like work one, rest four ratio. We went, we told people to go at, at, at 50 to 60% um, speed because we didn't want to have any quads or hamstrings or things like that. And it's, and it's been pretty, pretty good. Um, and, and I think it's been a decent way to ramp up now. Um, again, the tough thing is once we come out on the other side of this, I don't know if we still won't just have those 10 days of, um, uh, of preseason, but it, it was interesting the first couple of weeks and, and probably it wasn't until the fourth week, did we go a work one rest one ratio, um, fitness wise, um, which is, which I would say, what do you think? Um, I mean, I would think in preseason, we probably started at a minimum of work one rest two. Um, don't you think, um, what do you, what do you all think? And so, a potential opportunity yeah, here. Definitely. And the fitness test was usually work one, rest one a little yeah. bit <laughs> on, on that on that opening, um, on that opening day, and then and then maybe we went, but but at minimum, you know, and that's so again, that's where players have to 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 come in really really fit when there's those shorter times. But I, I we'll have to, you know, when we when we get again on the other side of this, we'll have to figure out okay, how do we want to do um, those things, um, those things to start with. Now, um, have either of you done any training with with um, or during all this had it had to do any training with a mask on? Yeah, well, I trained for the marathon, yep. virtual marathon, um, but I spent most of I say March through June. Uh, out with my mom and she lives in the middle of nowhere and so there's no people and so didn't have to do much with the mask there but definitely coming back to the boston area i sort of run with it put it on when i pass people take it off but it's been i can't imagine playing sport with it i don't know it's different it's yeah. different a little bit like when you're trying probably most of it it's different like in your recovery breath yeah like you like if, as you're trying to breathe in through that mask as opposed to um as opposed to um as opposed to being able to just gulp air when when you're not when you're not wearing a mask when you when you're really recovering um but but that so that even took a little bit of getting used to um just just um the the first week and a half of our training this fall so far yeah ron can you can you elaborate a little bit more uh you know training life in covid uh you know for maybe folks who who don't get to see the inside and what uh you know what that's been like for you and your program so far you know it's it's i i think it's been one i think the the team has done an excellent job so far um with with some of the hanover ordinances um and there's a little good build up in the in this game that maybe if that last pass was a little harder loose would have been able to take a shot right away um but a good little combo um the the with some of the ordinances we have our our numbers are like we're in groups of 10 10 or less um we are training in masks right now and that's mostly because hanover has a mask ordinance right now and um and we are training distanced so we're six feet apart from each other and um and so there's there's not contact um and so we're doing a lot of technical things um there are some different there are some different um games we can play where where one team is uh, is playing a ball around the back and they'll try to break down another team and find a a small goal behind them. Um, and so you're working on pressure, cover balance, and it, it's, it's pretty game-like, but there hasn't been physical contact where, where you are 
um, where you are able to shoulder tackle somebody off the ball or slide tackle or those type of things. And so that's a little different. Um, but I, but I think the, the group has responded well. And, and I think some of the, the, there's been little pieces and, and I think our, the coaching staff and Taylor and Nicole have done an excellent job of, of bringing out some things that are really trying to hone in on, on getting technically faster with the ball and then some repetitions of, of shooting or some long balls to work on some of those things that, um, that, that again, like, that's what I, Shar and Gia did a great job of before or after practice because usually in the fall you're doing a lot of things with the team and you don't want to overtrain where you go into games um, tired. And so some of those reps that we're doing right now, they would do either before or after practice. Uh, we got a little bit of a couple minutes left here in this first half here on Big Green Classic, but I'll ask uh, Charlotte and Gia, and uh, Charlotte, I'll lead off with uh, you here. Uh, do you remember that first game you played in as a uh, Dartmouth, as a member of the Dartmouth Big Green? Do you remember that first moment stepping onto the field uh, and, and just kind of describe what that moment was like for you? And Charlotte, we'll start with you. I remember leading up to it, I was so nervous, like, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, nervous. Um, but then I remember at least like with the very first scrimmage, like against St. Rose, like stepping on, I think I tripped over my shoelace. But after that, being like thinking, oh wow, like, okay, this is like, this is fun. This is like fine, you're fine. Um, and it was, I built it up in my head a lot more than I should have and stepping on was like it's soccer like this is what you love to do and it was pretty seamless and fun and I remember we won that game it was like it was a really great experience and I was like okay like this you can do this uh this is great but... Gia the the first time you stepped onto the field as a member of the big green what was that like Pretty sure it was against CVM, and I can remember within the first five minutes, I crashed into the scoring table. I vividly remember that, so <laughs> similarly frantic, I think. But again, as you kind of play in more games, I think you settle down. But it's still the the feeling never goes away, even as a senior. It's the same special feeling putting on the jersey, and especially on Burnham. Ron, can you, as, as a coach, I'm sure you know there's a million things you're you're focusing on in that, but can you kind of get a sense? When you see a, a player who, you know, freshman or, you know, first time getting on that field, can you kind of see that, you know, that there's nerves there? And, you know, do, do you have something that you go about in trying to, you know, calm those nerves from players? Or is that something that you leave them to do on their own? Um, oh, there's no calming the nerves. I, I mean, <laughs> shoot, I, I mean, as, as, as a coach, yeah. you, you get nervous every time there's a game or a first game of a year or things like that. But with players, like, you know, you just – if you see it, sometimes you'll just say, hey, you know, just take a really deep breath right now. And um, and um, I, I don't think with Charlotte and, and G, I had to do it. I, I have to admit, sometimes if somebody goes in and maybe the nerves are getting to them, we'll say, hey, your next touch, just hit it as far as you can forward um and then just and then just allow them to breathe a little bit and and every so often every every so often you 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 might have to say that it doesn't happen much but shoot you 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 can't get rid of the nerves especially on some of the first touches but um but a lot of time like with with college soccer if somebody goes in um in the first half um you there's no you you can't really sub and so so you, you just want to make sure that and and usually what happens is if you have in if you have in your head I'm going to make my first touch a hard touch whether it's a hard touch forward whether it's a good hard tackle something like that that sometimes calms you down and like like Charlotte said then you start saying to yourself hey I'm still playing soccer I'm not out here playing football or playing softball or anything like that still playing soccer I know what I'm doing here and and then people settle in um for sure um as uh, after the first couple minutes but heart rates are probably really really high when it's your first time on the field we only got about a minute left here coach but uh, since i asked charlotte and uh, gia what was that first moment like for you head coach of the dartmouth big green do you remember it do you remember the feelings going through it 
I, I, you know what? I the um I'm I'm trying to the, my first game was a spring game um, when I came in the spring. I do remember, um, and at the time, I think I was just on campus for about a year, and so the assistant coaches were Kelly Cuss uh, and, and Grace um, Barnard. And I said, hey, I want you two to do a lot of the coaching because they had just taken the team through the winter, and I said, I, I just I have to keep getting everybody's names and keep getting everybody's, you know, just who they are. But the first game was a spring game on Burnham. And so you're sitting on the bench and everybody watching the game, you see where the benches are. Well, when you look past the field, you're seeing the Appalachian Trail. And and I remember saying, whoa, this is beautiful. You know, this is one of the best views you can have just looking up into the hills there. So I, I remember that. Now, the spring, you're not as nervous. I, 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 maybe that's a good question for the other half. I'll try to think of that first game we played. All right, we'll let you stew on that, Coach, as uh, we've uh, reached the end of the first half here on Big Green Classic, a nil-nil draw right now in the first half. Big Green and the Big Red from – November 7th, 2015, the Ivy League regular season finale. We'll have the second half. More with Ron Rainey, Charlotte Esty, Gia Parker when we come back here on Big Green Classic. Make your debit card green. Big Green. Select from 16 options by visiting any Ledyard Bank location or call 888-746-4562. Ledyard's online and mobile banking includes free personal mobile check deposit, so you can show all your Dartmouth pride on your home turf. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. There are lots of things that are true about each of us, but sometimes we are held back from being ourselves. Sometimes we are told we can't do a certain thing because we're a boy or a girl, but it's okay to be who we are. Girls can be messy and boys can be neat. Girls can be fast and boys can be creative. It's good for both boys and girls to talk about their feelings and to clean up their messes. It's okay for all of us to be scared, brave, loud, quiet, gentle, and smart. And it's always good to ask for help when we need it. We get to decide who we want to be and how we want to spend our time. All that matters is we are genuine and no one is getting hurt. I'll support you in being yourself and I hope that you'll support me. Domino's is serious about food safety. That's why your pizza stays untouched after baking at 450 degrees. And now that every delivery is contactless, you can safely mix and match any two or more for just $5.99 each when you sit around the table, even if it's not the same table. All right, welcome back. Big Green Sports Classics here on DartmouthSports.com as it's women's soccer from 2015, Dartmouth and Cornell in the regular season Ivy League uh, matchup. Brett Franklin with you, joined by the head coach of Dartmouth women's soccer, Ron Rainey, also joined by alums Gia Parker and Charlotte Esty. After a scoreless first half, we're ready for the second half uh, of action. Uh, coach, I wanted to kind of continue on our conversation from uh, from the first half. Uh, I had asked you about, uh, I'd asked everybody about their first game as a member of the uh, Dartmouth soccer program. Um, you mentioned about your first game being uh, in the spring, but uh, when did the when was that first nerves kicking up? I think you were mentioning during the break uh, that first Ivy League game for you was one that really sticks out. Yeah, it, it 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 probably was because as as we looked at it and thought about it, um, the first game was against Portland, and, and Portland at the time was ranked 14 in the country. And so, you know, you go into that game saying, "Hey, let's put our best foot forward," and we did. I think I think that game might have ended. Um, might have ended uh it, it was either one goal game or a two goal game late but we were probably the underdog in it when you're the underdog you just want to go out and play hard and play well and we did i think that one of one where i felt real real nervous was first ivy league game 
um, and 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 it was you know it again with the schedule it's always it's always the same right now, and that's against Brown, um, but you have two teams wanting to get a result um, to open up the Ivy um, conference season on the right foot. And, and when we talked, we talked about the speed of play and those type of things. I mean, those games are played maybe at two or three times the speed it feels like. And sometimes maybe not keeping possession of the ball as much as you want. But again, um, one of the neat things, uh, you know, about the Ivy League against peer institutions is how much people want to beat each other. So people always ask, who's your, who's your, um, who's your biggest rival? A lot of times I think it's whatever Ivy team you're playing um, because, you know, some of the, some of these, some of the players know people on the other team, those type of things. There might be some heated rivalries over the years. And, and, and I think that you can, you can feel um, the energy and excitement and sometimes the, the, um, the desperation to get a result in, in those Ivy league games. Gia, can you speak to, you know, the, the Ivy League season and, you know, uh, I think, you know, Coach is right, you know, where we ask who, you, who is their biggest rival. I mean, every game is so big because there, there's no tournament. But, you know, what do, what do you think some of the difference are that maybe you could put your thumb on from Ivy League women's soccer as compared to maybe some of the other conferences? What do you think is that that difference or uh, that makes it unique in your break that up and um, I think it's pretty unique that we only get one chance to play them and it's always in the exact same order i don't really know how other conferences work maybe they get to play each in conference room twice i'm not sure but i think when you know that you only have those few opportunities to get a result against a team in your conference it makes those games so much more special and i think the rivalry is so big just because it's you know you're going up against harvard you're going up against princeton like these great intense schools and also great at soccer so you always you want to have a good win against an IV and it's always brown is always our first one so it's that game is always comes with a lot of um i guess extra baggage because you don't want to start off your season on a on the wrong foot so you want to get a good result against brown same question to you charlotte uh what makes the ivy league conference unique as compared to maybe some of the other conferences that uh, maybe you've talked to people about or, or that you've seen trying to be settled by crawl i think one thing um that's different is that we don't have a tournament at the end and so you go into that first game and there's championship energy like it feels like you're playing for the title right from the get-go i mean and you are obviously but it's a complete and total like, energy shift um and it's kind of indescribable, but it's just so competitive. And like, I remember even this past year, like when we were going up against Brown for the first time and they were coming in with like a really hot start. And so were we um, coming out of that warm up and just being like drenched in sweat, like no other kind of warm up. And it's just like, you want it so badly. And it's, it's such an incredible experience. I. It's hard to put into words, but and it's so here. fierce um, and fun. You look at it, Ron, uh, with this, with the Ivy League setup, you know, and, and I know you've tried over the years to sprinkle yeah, in some non-league games here and there, there. during league yeah, play. But for the most part, up. it's one game a week. And I got to imagine you probably Can like that as a coach in the sense in that the you, you have that prep time, but obviously – you want to be playing. You want to keep that momentum. Is it was that a little bit of a difficult adjustment for you going to that one week, uh, you know, league game uh, when you first uh, came here to Dartmouth? It was interesting for sure. Um, and and uh, again, mo most of the um, most of the schools I had been at, you were probably a, a two um, two game a weekend, either Thursday, Sunday, or Friday, Sunday, and so. If if maybe you didn't play the way you wanted to in that first game, you said, "Okay, well, we got to put that behind us and 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 um and focus on the next one." And then so and then you could also have some weekends there if you split or you know if you ever went through a weekend with two wins, you were on cloud nine. If you split a weekend, we you, you know you came out with something good. Um, and then obviously, if you lost a couple, then then you were pretty down. But with the one game a week. Um, there is there there's making sure to try to um, make sure the energy level um, 
is build as you go through the week. So then you can arrive at the game, not mentally tired or, or things like that. It was a little bit of a, of a, of a switch for sure. And at times when we've done, um, we've had some weeks, I, I also think that some of the non non league or non conference games during conference season have been good. Um, we've had some weeks where that's been good because you can play a game and that game is almost and better than any practice you could have, nice um, you know, for, for a week as a season gets deeper and deeper into the year. Um, and so just of trying of to make sure you're, you're doing those I'm things well, again, so you yeah. keep your team healthy, um, but also at a, at a good place mentally, the because the most important game of the week Sends is the conference back. game for sure. The Ivy league game. From a player's perspective, Charlotte, and then G, you can you can chime in after. Um, you know how big of a difference is that? You know, playing that one game a week. Say, if you don't have a, a, a non-conference game uh, mashed in there, uh, what what does that do for you from a player's psyche, from a player's per- preparation standpoint? Uh, how did you go into that week when you do just have that one conference game leading up, and Charlie can lead off first? It's definitely strange. Um, Midfield. Yeah, because you're, you're so front-heavy, your schedule, and then all of a sudden it just kind of stops, and that's a bit abrupt and, and odd. But um, we – I mean, obviously the coaches handle it really well, and so you kind of get into a nice rhythm where you know that you're going to have really, like, hard practices um, in lieu of games, like, early in the week on that Tuesday or that Wednesday um, where you're getting just as good training as you would have gotten out of that game pretty much. Um, and so you kind of know what you're getting into, um, and get into that rhythm, but it, at first it's definitely a shock for sure. Okay. Yeah, I think it, um, it was, it was definitely made for a long week when we only had a game on a Saturday, but like Char said, the coaches know how to do it. That's their job to get us prepared for the games on the weekend. So it, it, I never felt it. not prepared because we had so much of a gap in between. I'm sorry, all of my pets joining. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. We got a special guest shot. appearance uh, yeah. for sure here on the, here on the broadcast. And, and uh, again, right, maybe you hit on it in your last segment, but did, you know, had your approach change on that just as far as you know your preparation as you build and like we said before you over the years you've put in those non-conference games to try and 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 you know and and get a little bit more action as you get towards the tail end of the season but had your approach changed over the last six or seven seasons on how you go about that i think so because um because a lot of times if you if you play two games in a weekend you you have two or three days where you really have to think about your recovery um and when you just play one game in a weekend you can layer some more things in and and like charlotte said maybe have a couple um pretty intense practices early in the week um before tapering to get legs back and those type of things and and in those in those early um in those early practices um of the week maybe throw something in there um that what the opponent does and 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 um and and do it in what would be an up tempo uh fast game usually with a lot of finishing but maybe if an opponent like to try to get to the end line then you could play uh, a game where there's a lot of service a lot of goals where the players are enjoying that and they like those type of games or transition games those type of things um but then all of a sudden when you play the game on the Saturday, those um, those skills come out and and allow you to be effective um, in those single games. But I, so I, I think it's good because you can you can add some things in and be a little bit more prepared for um, prepared for the opponent. Um, and then you're also you're you're also if if you do it right, you're also um, almost back to. Um, when you get 12, 13 weeks in, you're never totally healthy anymore. There's always some little knocks and dings and those type of things that you're dealing with, but you're probably getting close to as, um, close to as, as healthy as you can for just the single game weeks. Coach, for those of us who maybe don't know the, the nuts and bolts, you know, outside of what we see on, on game day, can you walk us through what a typical week is like for your program leading up to a league game and just 
how you go about it each day and, and what that looks like for your program. It, it, we're, we're, we're saying this is a normal season, not what we're dealing with here in COVID-19, but what that week looks like for you. Yeah, it's, it's probably, it's probably better to almost start for, like usually the IB games are on, um, almost always on on saturday there's one or two you know sometimes a friday sometimes a ton, sunday but they're almost always on saturday so you have that game day um on friday um i've always been a big believer of of um of trying to just be on the field for about an hour um knowing how much um how much energy is going to be expended the next day um there are some people, but what, what we try to do also is we try to give the, the players maybe in that hour, 15 minutes to work on something that will give them confidence. So we kind of call it self-training. So you'll see some people go over and take crosses. You'll see some people do restarts. You'll see some people do some extra shots or just something that, that if they, if they do it, it'll give them confidence um heading into the game you know and so that would be the friday the thursday i think you can put a lot of the tactical things that that maybe the team will have to um get ready for um so so um pull out what the opponent does well and maybe put that into a practice or hey they try to do this on a restart or or maybe this is how they try to attack or this is how they try to defend and and you can even do that in a in playing a little bit of 11 aside maybe 10 15 20 minutes of 11 aside um when um when Tuesday and Wednesday, and I've always thought out. that really good things to do would be to have, you know, no longer than 90 minute practices, but doing things that helps your Dirty team speed of play. Attention. And so playing transition games, Just playing small sided games to goal, um, playing competitive um, um, possession games that allow that that players like and they they like to play them and 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 get them into a rhythm of playing really fast and address anything that we want to address from the um um from the game the week before hey we could have maybe this went really well we want to keep doing this or this is something we want to improve upon and um and then somewhere either sunday or monday you're taking your day off and one of those days you're probably doing a recovery practice Dan where maybe you just go for about an hour, um, but play a little small sided, play. do something so where um, no where score. where you, you can get the team in a good frame of mind for the week ahead, um, is 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 what we try to do. We'll come back. I want to ask Charlotte and uh, and Gia there as a player what it's like for them leading up to a, to an Ivy League game. Uh, as far as preparation goes, we are though not to play spoiler here. Though we are coming up to the. The first uh, goal of this game, which has been a tight contested game here, Ron, and, you know, Cornell uh, and your squad, you know, uh, possession has kind of gone back and forth here, but this has been a tight, tough battle, which I'm sure you expected in this game. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, Lucille gets on the end of this and, and she she plays a nice one-time shot, but there there's a good ball out wide. Um, and... In this half, and, uh, though, you know, for everybody bit, watching as, as they're hearing some of the commentary, there, we've had a couple good chances and gotten to the end line. Cornell almost scored on themselves, 30, it looked 20, like, on that one flyer, where somebody slammed the ball across. But if I remember correctly, Lucille peels out and, and we get a ball I, and we get a ball played out to her. And I, I, I think she hits a one-touch uh, shot here. But, again, in this season – uh, Lucille Kozlov, who goes by Cornell Luce um, from British Columbia. I, I want to say she had uh, anywhere from 11 to 12 goals and, and a couple multiple goal, um, multiple goal multiple games uh, during up. this season. And, and um, so it was, it, it, it's appropriate. Um, it's appropriate nice that she's the one who, got, who gets on the end of this um, the as, of as we watch. Um, so yeah, she, just for the record, Ron, she had, a, a you were right. 11 goals that season, a, a team high along with second team, all Ivy. Yes. Yes. So this is one that that's, that looks like Holly. Um, and so she wins a tackle, does a ton of work in the midfield for us. Lauren Lucas on the ball. 
And I think maybe Luz just dices this kit. She just beats her. That's a great finish. Um, so that's that's a, that's a that's a you know loose. A, a lot of times Lucille would get on the end of crosses and score in one touch things like that. Man, they, there that's just taking the moment and saying. I'm better than you, 1v1, and she beat her. And then that finish to the to the far post where the goalkeeper probably knows that's where you're trying to hit it, and she still beat her. So that that was a great that was a great finish there to go up 1-0. Yeah, that was a very nice goal. And, uh, you know, Charlotte, I imagine, you know, as a player and as Ron alluded to in this game here, uh, you know, a lot of close, you know, close shots, a lot of almost uh, goals for your team. And I imagine this as a player – uh, the mental aspect, staying within the game when you're not getting those looks, when things aren't going your way, at, you know, at the college level, I imagine that is such a big part of it is, you know, staying in the moment, not getting too down on yourself and, and really that mental aspect of the game. Did you find that to be true for you? Uh, definitely. I think I might have to change my answer from before about the hardest adjustment to college soccer is that it is so hard to score. Um, and so you've got to go through a lot of those almost uh, so close um, frustrating moments and, you know, take the moments that are presented to you the way Lucille just did in that play. Um, but it can definitely be frustrating in certain moments. Um and that's why most of our games, especially within the league, are so close. Is it's it's so hard to score. Um, so when you do, it feels just awesome, <laughs> and that was a beautiful goal. Um, but it takes a lot um, for sure. Charlotte, what what was your best goal of your career, Charlotte? What do you think at, at Dartmouth? Um. Probably against TUNH my junior year. Yeah, the, the, not not even kidding. We we pulled that highlight up because um because I was talking to Nicole and Taylor, our assistant coach, and we were like, hey, Gia's gonna be on, and Charlotte's gonna be on, and um the and and, the and I said you Sends I said Taylor, you what? weren't here, but look look at this the goal Charlotte block. scored against um against UNH to to, to win in overtime, here. and it's still this that's still a, a highlight Durham goal that would be up. on on any goal scorers any goal scorer is real it was one of those that it seemed like it got faster the last eight or nine yards before it went in the net and the shot was about uh 20 yards out it was it was just a great goal to win in in overtime and and it's golden goal so everybody gets to run on the field and and um and celebrate so that was pretty cool uh, that's a great question, Ron. Uh, I'll ask uh, Gia that same question if she has a uh, memorable goal. Now, the the following season, Gia, you had a goal against the Big Red out in Ithaca. So uh, I'm wondering if that's maybe high up there uh, on your list or what's one that comes to mind for you? Um, I think that for sure because I think that was the only goal I ever scored against an Ivy. And like we've been talking about, that carries a lot of weight. Um, but I think my favorite goal was against Holy Cross my senior year, although it was – a little bit. The fans thought it was offsides, but I'm so convinced that, that I was onsides. The film just happened to cut off right where the when whoever passed it to me passed it, but I think I was onsides. <laughs> that was um Claire. Claire Trop played it over the yes. top to you. Yeah. Hey, the referee didn't raise the flag, so that means you were onside. Yep. <laughs> this is a pro Dartmouth broadcast, so you were onside, Gia. There's no, there's no doubt about that uh, whatso whatsoever. Um, looking at uh, you know, looking at your soccer career, Charlotte and Gia. Um, what made you love the game so much? Was there you know, was there a moment? Was there a player? What made the game of soccer so fun for you, and eventually turning it into? A collegiate career, Gia. I'll, I'll start Fast with you. Pace on this game thus far. Um, I guess growing up, well, my mom played basketball in college, so I think that's what she was hoping that I was going to end up doing. But when she realized it was soccer, she tried to learn soccer for me. So I think just that having that be a thing that I did with her, training with her all the time. Um, I guess uh, my teammates. Yeah, but I think just. I, getting to college, for sure, my teammates. Um, leading up to college, I think just having that be the thing that I did with my mom and I was passionate about, and 
Dermot yeah. moving to the ball very, very Charlotte, quickly same question uh, for you. Champagne sends it across. I think I was really fortunate. I had a great coach, um, Doc Simpson, who was my club coach from, like, when I started in fourth grade, and then he came to my high school and then was still my summer league coach until I graduated college pretty much and was, like, an uncle to me by the end. Um, and so he was a big – part of my life and a reason why I stuck with soccer um as well as like one of my best friends Carrie um Zerfoss, who I grew up with and I think she played a big part because she would play attacking mid and I'd play forward and we would just kind of play with each other um a lot which is makes such a big difference just having someone who you're so in sync with that it's just so fun to play um and then I also just liked the like creativity of the game and I liked that there was a like really intellectual side to it um and I thought it was something that I don't know I think was for me a big difference because I played like basketball also but I was not as good and didn't understand the game as well um so I pretty quickly uh shifted my focus to soccer um and like fell in love with that that aspect of the game Ron, I'm going to ask you the same question. I mean, what what drew you to the game? You know, was there, did you have a a hero in the game that you really looked up to? What what drew you to the game of soccer? You know, back, back when I was growing up, there, there wasn't as much soccer on television now. I mean, which, how, how cool is it now that you can basically turn it on any day and, and watch a high level match. When we were growing up, there was a show that they put on PBS that was called soccer made in Germany um, and they would just do highlights of um, of, of, of different soccer a different European soccer matches and it was um, and and so and 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 again the sport was still still just growing around us my dad was a basketball coach in college and and my my parents were supportive of all the sports that we did and and but after a while i was kind of done with basketball but and really concentrated on soccer and and um yeah, and what what draws me to it is I, I I do like running I I, I like the exercise but the you know the skill it takes to do what you need to do with the ball to score a goal um, and and having all those different moments where um, where you know near misses or or how like constant pressure usually or you hope it leads to a goal eventually all those th- different things I think are pretty cool. But part of um well uh, of our sport but um you know i i think Ramey that um you know the heroes or things like that growing up it, it was it was probably watching that pbs show on saturday morning soccer made in germany and they would show 30 minute highlights with which was um which was pretty cool again the these these players are lucky because now um not only can you see high level soccer you can see high level women's soccer and that's something that um G- Gia was talking about it um earlier the first and game I coached was for Dartmouth was at a tournament in Wisconsin uh, or, or at Washington but the other team was at was Wisconsin and and Rose Lavelle who is now one of the stars on the um women's national team was playing um in that game and to to think about how much you can turn on the TV and and see our national team play or or Manchester City or you know, all, or all the or the NWSL teams play. It's it's really cool um, for players growing up to have some of those heroes um, and and be able to take after them. But I, I, soccer is one of the greatest sports again because all that goes into it to score a goal, all that goes into it to um, to defend. And when you have the ball, you're the quarterback. You you kind of control the whole game, and that's um, that's that's I think pretty cool and stuff about our sport charlotte you uh you are continuing and your your uh, playing uh, career uh, across the pond if you will uh over uh, over in england but uh, can you tell us a little bit about you know once you graduated dartmouth uh, what you're doing now and you know similarities differences as far as uh playing college soccer here in the states and and what you're doing uh, across the pond yeah right now um i'm at the university of st andrews um playing soccer and doing a master's program um and it's like the 
best thing that probably could have happened. I had no idea what I was going to do after college. Um, and then with COVID and everything, yeah, I had even like less of an idea than I probably did before. Um, and the coach reached out to a bunch of us and just said, we have this opportunity. Um, your NCAA eligibility doesn't matter because we're international and we have scholarship money and like come check it out um and it's been amazing because we're playing uh first of all which is great we're doing full contact trainings um we just got cleared to do friendly matches um and so it's been great um I've missed soccer a lot the past uh, the nine months that I had kind of in retirement. Um, so it's definitely awesome to be back out there. Um, it's it's different for sure, um, but it's amazing. Just as far as the the style of play, because um, I'm always fascinated the the game and how it's played in, in different countries. Uh, similar, different from what you've been able to gather so far as to compared to the States, how, how would you compare the two as far as style of play or what that is expected of you to be style of play for this, uh, for this club? Um, it's, it's slightly different from what I've seen so far in that like so many people just watch so much soccer here. Um, more so than I think with people in the States or at least with like women in the states like myself included and that's come like that's from my own experience really is i know that i should probably be watching more um soccer especially european soccer it's i'm, I'm bad at doing that um but you can see how much uh they watch it here and how passionate they are about it here and so much of the tactics kind of comes from watching those games and it's really like and here's really tactical Again, focused cool. um which Never is it's interesting fun. it's Alano. different like we were in just like a great rhythm i felt like at dartmouth where we'd start out with our technical and then move into our training and then do our tactical and stuff and here it's a, we don't necessarily start with the technical which is different and it's just like Perhaps let's go over some tactics and then let's play field. um which is different it's also it's and like covid so it might just be the situation um but it's fun to hear That's all of them talk about the games that they watch and i will it's my goal to get more involved in actually one. watching them myself um but that that element has been different and, and fun for sure charlotte what what will the sub rules be for your games will they do will they do fifa subs or do you know that's a really good question i am not sure sorry but I was going to say, Brett, like they might do FIFA rules, which would be um, just three be sub substitutes a game. And that then so that really makes it so that, um, that really game. makes it tactical because there there are some fatigues even in a 90 minute game. And you can see like this game against Cornell, both teams are going back and forth and back and forth. And some of that is, in essence, we're allowed almost unlimited subs. Um, if you go out in the first half, you can't go back in. If you go out in the second half, you can go back in once. So the speed of it, so the speed of it always stays similar. But if they do, if they do limited subs, it, it definitely changes. Um, like when you get the ball, you don't want to. I'm sure, Charlotte. I mean, if they, like giving up possession, they don't want to give up possession. There, correct? Correct. That's actually, that's a really interesting point because I hadn't even picked up on that, but I had picked up on the fact that we hadn't really been subbing, even though it was just friendlies. And I think that it might've been because of those subbing rules that you were mentioning um, and being in the habit of doing that. Um, because I remember being like, oh, like this is strange. We're not really subbing and this is just a friendly, but that would make a lot of sense as to why that was the case for sure. Um, so that's interesting. That's a good point. Ron, does that, I, yeah, go ahead. Does that help you, Charlotte? Like, so does that like and in some of the games, do they depend one. on you like in the attacking the third side. to make the runs that you do off the ball to Lucas open things up for your team over there? I think so. Um, I hope so. I've been playing on center mid a bit more, which has been uh, different. Um, it's a little more defensive responsibility than I'm used to, but 
I like it. I like getting the touches on the ball. Um, so I'm still adjusting, but it, it's good. Ron, not to uh, put you on the spot here, but uh, I'm, I imagine you've had other players that have had opportunities to play uh, overseas or, or what have you. Has have there been a many over the years? or It hasn't been unlimited, but there's been a few. Um, and then the other, the other Dartmouth player, Tatiana Saunders, she's a goalkeeper. And she played on a team in Iceland and then went over to France and played on a couple teams there. And now she's doing an NBA program in England and playing on a team right now. And then um, and then a a couple kids that um, a couple of players who were at who graduated from Iowa, one who is playing over in Portugal, who who played in Iceland, who actually um, our Icelandic player right now missed, uh, knew her as a player because um, um, she she, um, was a forward who was a goal scorer. So, um, and then went over to Portugal and then one player who played um, in um, in Holland um, as well. And, And I think that now like we hope that that more players want to do what what charlotte's doing and 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 um because d- definitely like like as a again. soccer player you're probably you, one after college you still want people to be healthy and and Gordon fit and all those different types of things middle. gia will be able to and speak about some of her stuff in. that she's doing to stay fit it and healthy wide. but t- two but you know as a as a soccer player and you so you keep learning about the game as you go through ages 23 well, 24 well 25 26 and that those might be your best years and it's it's just cool now that um it's cool now that people have those opportunities um, to be able to play on some of these teams after they graduate uh, college, if they if they want to do that. So hopefully we'll have some more, and I think some some more that um, would have an interest in playing a little bit professionally. Gia, what's uh, what has been life post Dartmouth soccer? Have you? Been playing pickup. Well, what have you? You told us you did the the, the Boston Marathon shot, virtually, uh, which is which is great. And congratulations. Um, what 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 has life been like after soccer? Have you been able to get your fix? Tell us a little bit about that. I'm actually very jealous hearing Char talking about still playing. Um, I wish that I had done that. That sounds exactly like what I should have done. Um, but <laughs> here we are. Um, I. I definitely found that I need some competitive athletic outlets. So I, my senior year after soccer was over, I ran the marathon. And then again, I just did it. I've run three marathons now. I think I'm done with the marathons, but um, maybe triathlons are my next thing. But I've definitely missed that competitiveness. I found that I have a hard time playing soccer because I'm not quite as agile as I once was. And my skills aren't quite there. So I find myself kind of being almost sad when I play pickup because I'm not quite at that level. So I've, I've done some basketball. I played kickball, um, just some other ways to kind of stay active. I did play soccer last fall, but I don't know. But it's definitely tough to turn off the competitive switch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How was it doing like when you when you did your um the, the virtual and, and, and G also the first time she did the Boston was on a brutally cold it day, right? A gorgeous Lots. day here in Hanover. And so, so, me, so you can tell the mental fortitude because it was the day when, when, um, what was it? Down to in the in the low forties or in the thirty-five degrees in pouring rain, a twenty-mile park. So not everybody completed that one, probably. Um, it, it, <laughs> yeah. yeah, Gia, what, what made you decide to run the Boston Marathon? What, what was that uh, What was that decision? Um, I actually saw, I saw a number of people who were maybe a year or two older than me in soccer. A few played at BC and other places. Every time they finished, a girl at BU actually too, they finished. That was what they did their senior spring. So I kind of knew since freshman year, like that's what I was going to do my senior year. Um, and I found a charity that I liked and I applied for the team and I got in. So. I it seemed fitting to sort of continue my running, I guess, but definitely took a long break after that. <laughs> I did want to make sure we, we sneak in here um, talking about 
being a, a Dartmouth alum now, you know, obviously, Charlie, you're you're still you're doing grad school right now. Um, and Gia, maybe you can speak to this a little bit more. But you know, now that you've graduated, you've you've got your degree from Dartmouth. Putting it all, all into perspective, your four years, you know, off the field, you know, how, how has Dartmouth experience changed you as a person, has benefited you now being in the professional world? Gia, yeah, I'll start with you. Just just what is life like outside of Dartmouth and how you've been able to make that transition into the professional world? Sure. Um, I definitely, I think, being an athlete at Dartmouth, not at Dartmouth, definitely sort of sets us up for having – good work ethic I think in my office even though it's yeah, not a sport I find have. myself having to always be the hardest worker and staying late to you know get stuff done but um I think in. being a Dartmouth and alum I found that what in the three. beginning I was sort of trying to find my footing and find the job for me Dartmouth alums will it. it's insane you just reach out to them one time and they'll do anything they can to help you get a job so I think being an alum from Dartmouth sets you sets you um up just to have unlimited opportunities so i'm very grateful for that and uh charlotte just from the short time that you've uh, left here in, in hanover just what has that meant dartmouth to you Canada being a dartmouth alum? alum i'm sure you'll have more experiences down the line but just in that short time to the outside. you know what what have maybe you missed there since you've lived you you've left place. hanover in just the Leap. the short few months and that uh, that you've been uh, overseas um I've missed <laughs> like everything, but um, yeah, the team, the campus, the foliage this fall, that was a weird thing that I never thought I'd miss, <laughs> but I missed seeing like the trees change and going with the team to see them and everything, which was really strange. But um, I definitely am grateful for Dartmouth and that like pre like down. furthering my academics I feel so prepared and slightly disconcerting that like the master's program feels easier than going to classes at Dartmouth but it's also just um, kind of a sign that they prepared us so well and um, I'm, I'm really grateful for that and miss it a lot <laughs> for sure. Ron, I'm sure you know when you talk to recruits, when you're when you talk to players, you know past and, and present. You know, obviously we you talk about you know the memories on the field, but I know from your perspective, it's giving the student athlete the well-rounded um, experience, and that you know, as Charlotte just said, you know the the tight campus community, you know the winters, the foliage. I mean, uh, there's a lot you know besides obviously. What the program down. can offer, but the college as a whole, I, I imagine and it's got to be very interesting there. when you bring students Dartmouth for the Bill first time Bill. on campus to see Dartmouth. It's got to be a very interesting experience. To play now. I think so, and and I think that in, in the end, um, I mean, we have two people on now. tonight who I think great. really represent the best of Dartmouth, and 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 what what we want, you know, what and what Dartmouth wants in their graduates Dartmouth when the when they up. take their next steps because. I think the character and who they are as people um, will make them a great part of, of, of any team. And and that was something I think that um, even in this season or this year, or the years going through, like you want everybody to have a great experience. The doors that open up going to Dartmouth and being in the Ivy League are, are going to be there, but you also want people, um, you, you, you want people to be part of a group that, um, like I said, that, that makes it better for the person sitting next to you. And I think that, um, I think that Charlotte and Gia were a huge part of that. And, and, and Gia, even her, her senior year, um, being captain of, of the team really helped. I think our program figure out that, this is this is now. a huge part of what I have to do to to make this experience really fun. So to have people talk about Dartmouth uh, the way these two are doing, but I I also like I said, Dartmouth wants people like Charlotte and Gia out out in the world saying they're Dartmouth grads um, because. I'm sure that when their bosses are asked who, who's a hard worker, who's a team player, I mean, I, you know, Gia's name is going to come to mind. And, and um, Charlotte's coach over at St. Andrews, 
just sent me an email. She doesn't even know this. Sent me an email a couple days ago and just said like she has been a great addition to what we're trying to do here. So like those are those are things that um I think are huge um, when you're looking at that that holistic part of of being a college student athlete. Charlotte, I'll uh, I'll lead with you. G, you can follow. Then Ron, I want to get your uh, thoughts on just. We talked about being a Dartmouth alum, but uh, can you speak more to being a women's soccer alum and just kind of, you know, the, the, the bond that you have with your teammates? And as I'm sure you, you guys still talk to many of your former teammates, but what does it mean to you to be a, a Dartmouth women's soccer alum now that you are you are an alum and, and, and you have that perspective? Uh, Charlotte, I'll start with you. Yeah, I still don't feel like an alum yet, but um, it's, yeah, they're, my teammates are my best friends still, um, and we talk every day still, and it's, it's again, the alum perspective is still new for me, but getting the, oh, the emails yeah. to, like, uh, friends of women's soccer and the alumni network, it's, it's weird, but I get excited, I'm like, oh, like, what's going on, um, and I love hearing about the team and staying connected with the team. Um, I still think of them as my team and my network of people. I, I'm still not quite over that yet, but um, I might have more answers when I <laughs> actually feel like an adult. But right now, I still think of myself as being on the team. <laughs> Gia, just, uh, you know, being a, a Dartmouth women's soccer alum and just kind of what that means to you and just kind of the relationships that maybe you've still been able to, to have here uh, since you've left Hanover. Yeah, what I think is cool is that no matter if you're talking to someone that I played with or somebody 10 years prior, the experiences are so similar. I actually have been babysitting, not now with coronavirus, but just on the side for a 2000 three alum, I think, um, who lives in the area. And she actually has helped me get my job when I first graduated out of college. And just having that same bond, even though we played however many years apart, just knowing that you're a Dartmouth women's soccer alum, I think just the connections are, they run deep. <laughs> Ron, I, I know, I don't want to speak for you, but I just know how important that alumni network is and, and what it means to the program and still having those alums uh, reach out. I, I know it's a very important piece for your program. Oh, it's huge, and and I think I, I think Gia said it. The 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 ties that that bind and um, being a, a Dartmouth women's soccer alum, it really is interesting. When there are some alumni events, um, you can have somebody who graduated in the seventies and somebody who graduated in the eighties, in the nineties, in two thousand and two thousand tens, and now two thousand twenties, and and you like. Like they're they're fast friends, you know. After just talking with each other for five or ten minutes, where you might have people spanning generations, and and um, um, but but some of the some of the things that Dartmouth they, they become fast friends, and and there's some ties that bind, which are which I think is a. I noticed that the first alumni event I went to, and and you you just um, when you see the um, alumni. Um, interact and 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 I think the the group has been so supportive um, that that it's awesome. One of the things that I think the alums will really really love is getting into the new Dartmouth indoor facility um, because Gia probably spans a group of about seven years where they all thought they were going to be playing in it. Um, and then it didn't quite get finished. And, and like, um, like Gia said, she was able to be in the Riley pavilion a little bit and Charlotte was able to be in there a little bit, but like, that'll, that'll be the, probably the first alumni match. We'll get a lot of people coming back to that one, one into, to see the new building because it, it's, it's quite awesome. Um, but that, and, and, and you know what, everybody will play soccer, but pretty quick they'll, they'll, um, they'll just be catching up on what they're doing, you know, with their lives after school and, and just having fun as a, as a group of alumni, as, as Dartmouth women's soccer alumni. Hey, another good point there, Ron. I wanted to make sure to touch on that new indoor facility and, and what that's going to mean for your program and for your training moving forward. Oh my gosh. It's making us so soft. These, these, <laughs> like, now, now, um, now we've, um, you know, if, if, if it's like, like at first we said, ah, if it gets below 
you know, third, if it gets below 35, we'll go inside. Well, that's kind of creeped up there as we've gone through the fall. So we've, we've been in there a lot. And, um, and, but I think that, um, what, what's great about it is, and, and right now during COVID time, um, if we had a 50 degree day, we'd be outside. If we had everybody training together right and now, our groups are, go. our pods We're are a little smaller. And so, here. so it, shot. but it has, it has made us a, a little on, I have to admit we've been, we've and been inside on a couple of the 50 outside. degree days. Um, <laughs> this, this fall on the surface is, is Here's good and the bluetooth you can put on your your nice clean playlist and and those type of here. things and listen to music as you're now. training and Cornell and i think really the players charging. love it but like i said we'll do and that for sure when the alumni come back it doesn't matter Perfect. what the weather's like i think they'll want to play in the new building I, I think probably a silly question but it, it's a big game changer for you especially in your off-season training where you know as we know winters are long here in the upper valley but i sure that's just got to make a huge difference in that aspect ron Huge, huge, yes. Coming up on the uh, final couple of minutes here on uh, Big Green uh, Classic as uh, Dartmouth trying to hang on to a 1-0 lead here and close out the uh, 2015 season on a high note. And with just kind of the final couple of minutes here, Charlotte and and Gia, you know, just kind of put it all into perspective for us. You know, uh, we've had a lot of great conversation here this evening and you have gave us a lot of great insight. So not to sound like you're repeating, but just kind of, Put this, you know, put your four years into perspective, your experience with Dartmouth women's soccer and just kind of what it means to you now having graduated and and into the real life, into the adult world, as they say. Um, I mean, I think I've probably said it, but just the four years at Dartmouth playing soccer, best four years of my life. Um, It was definitely quite the transition having to go into the real world, but I've taken sort of the memories and the skills I've learned and making the most of it, doing the best I can uh, as adulting, trying to adult. Um, But I, I love, I look forward to the next time that um, the team can play so I can keep cheering them on. Same question for you, Charlotte. What, what, now that you've, again, I know you're a new alum, relatively new beyond that, but just kind of what you've been able to take into perspective uh, for your four years. Yeah, um, I definitely, I'm still straddling the, uh, the adult world line and the student line for sure. But um, I, I miss Dartmouth soccer so much. It was everything. Thing. And so even just to receive like the text about <laughs> coming on and speaking with all of you and being here was so exciting and just made my day because it's something that, of course, I knew I was going to miss it, but I didn't even realize quite how much until it was the fall season and I wasn't playing soccer and I wasn't on Burnham um, with everyone. And so it's, yeah, it means everything. And it, I'm really glad to be here. And so thank you for having me. <laughs> Well, we appreciate all of you joining us as uh, the Big Green seal the win, 1-0 win. They close out the 2015 season on a high note and avenge the uh, previous season loss to the Big Red, uh, doing it with a 1-0 win here on November 7th, 2015 on the beautiful Burnham Field. Big thank you to Gia Parker. Big thank you to Charlotte Esty. Big thank you to the head coach of Dartmouth Women's Soccer, Ron Rainey, as uh, this was a lot of fun. And uh, thank you all for joining us here on Big Green Sports Classic. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, we will talk to you again here on Big Green Sports Classic. I'm Brad Franklin saying so long.